Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Hello everyone, I'm Troy Moley and thank you for joining us this week on Market Journal. Glad to be back with you and also special thanks to Bill Dodd for holding down the fort last week. Lots to get to on this week's show. And we're starting off with the weather. That's a big topic on people's minds this time of year. A few pockets of storms made their way through the state this week, but we are continuing to keep our eye on the drought monitor. As of this recording, the drought monitor map showed moderate drought north of the Platte River in eastern Nebraska. Abnormally dry to moderate drought conditions were reported from Nebraska's panhandle south into central Nebraska. All this coming during a crucial time in the growing season. D10 senior ag meteorologist Bryce Anderson joined me this week to sort through what we need to know. Well, there's no doubt that uh, there's there's a need for for water, and uh, the fact that that uh, you've got uh, such a demand going for irrigation, I think, has been a a real concern over the past several weeks. Uh, as we have seen the western half of the state turn quite a bit drier. Uh, one thing that has uh, maybe helped uh, a little bit in that respect is that uh, there's been uh, somewhat of a periodic uh, surge of some cooler air out of the northern plains that has worked its way southward and has helped to uh, maybe modify some of that heat stress a little bit. And then, of course, we have seen a few uh, rounds of uh, thunderstorms work across the eastern half of the state that have uh, certainly helped things out. But uh, there's been uh, a, a notable demand uh, for irrigation uh, during the past uh, month and uh, considering that uh, we're going into the real high usage time now from pollination all the way through uh, filling uh, with corn, I don't think that uh, there's gonna be much of a slowdown uh, the way things are, are appearing. We're not going to get maybe stressfully hot in the forecast, but it still is gonna be very warm. And uh, obviously this has been a very warm summer already. So uh, there's uh, no sense to think that uh, the rest of July and into August is gonna change that much. And Bryce, what about that dryness we've been seeing on the Western side of the state and out through the panhandle? Are we still seeing a big concern here when it comes to heat stress with cattle or with pasture conditions? Well, I think that there will be uh, the continued uh, concern about uh, pasture quality and uh, the, the stress that we're going to see in terms of uh, livestock conditions as well. Uh, the the uh, real, uh, real uh, long-standing uh, bubbles of, uh, of heat that uh, we had in mid-July, I think are going to largely be pretty well confined to maybe just a day or two as we go through the month of August. But uh, there's been, I think already, some performance uh, uh, reduction, uh, a little bit of a, come, a, uh, a drawdown in uh, performance because of uh, the kind of heat that we saw in mid-July. And then, uh, of course, the, the uh, impact on hay production, uh, when we think about uh, this being a, a prime season for taking care of uh, putting hay, hay up and harvesting that, uh, that's also uh, probably going to mean that uh, the yield on that hay crop is not going to be as large as we'd like to see. And all that being said, we've still had those on and off rain chances this week. Is that moving the needle much in terms of relief from this heat or recharging that soil moisture? Well, I think, uh, I think certainly the rainfall that we've had uh, during the past uh, several days is, uh, is helping to uh, set uh, corn and soybeans up for a pretty favorable run of moisture supplies now through the end of the month. And uh, we're, we're going to have uh, corn entirely pollinated here in, in uh, not very much longer. And uh, soybean flowering is uh, going to continue but uh, we know that soybeans actually can handle uh, some drier conditions uh, quite well. 
and uh, and uh, don't really uh, have a have a real issue with that. And uh, as far as uh, really recharging soil moisture supplies, I don't think we're going to be having too much of that happen, just because we're in a very high usage time of the season uh, for for crops and vegetation to take up the water supplies. But uh, the the good thing is that uh, there's not going to be uh, I think a lot of real uh, moisture deficits over the eastern half of the state uh, to work with. Thanks to Bryce for joining me this week and sharing that information. Stick around for later on in the show. Al Dutcher will be here with our full forecast. And next up, it may be possible to increase dryland corn or grain sorghum yields by as much as 35 bushels per acre by controlling weeds in wheat stubble. This can be achieved through implementing an echo fallow cropping system or echo farming system of controlling weeds. Market Journal's Bill Dodd caught up with Nebraska Extension Cropping System Specialist Bob Klein to discuss how producers can successfully practice these methods. It's been shown that each inch of soil water can increase the yield of corn or grain sorghum by approximately 12 bushels. When it comes to controlling weeds and wheat stubble, it is possible to save a significant amount of water in the soil profile. When properly managed, the eco-fallow cropping system can be especially helpful in dryland areas such as western Nebraska. One of the things when we named the eco-fallow system when we started that back in the early 70s, we wanted to really put emphasis on the treatments after harvest. And that means going in and controlling the weeds with minimum tillage and so forth, basically using herbicides and using them timely. So you save all that moisture and then also prevent those weeds from going to seed because that way you don't have to contend with all that weed seed the next year. And so we kind of named that the eco fallow period. So if we can save any water, it really benefits the next crop. And that's why it's so important to control weeds after winter wheat harvest. And on the average, our research shows out in North Platte area that we can save about three inches of water in the soil profile if we do a good job on weed, weed control after winter wheat harvest. And the some years, of course, it's a little bit less, some years more. And one of the things is see people say, well, we can just pray for three inches of rain instead. But the trouble is rainfall is 100% effective like that soil, that soil water you have in the soil. That's about 100% effective for the next crop. So we really want to take care and save that water. Another thing to consider besides weed control and wheat stubble is managing volunteer wheat. Left unchecked, wheat not dealt with after harvest can play a critical role in promoting crop disease as well as a place for unwanted pests to multiply and thrive. Volunteer wheat, you know, it can cause disease out there, but it's real good at using soil water. And if we don't control it, another factor that we can run into uh, going right into the next part is that uh, it provides a real good place in the fall if you've got uh, volunteer winter wheat out there for the army cutworm to lay eggs. And then they'll eat the emerging corn and grain sorghum crop. And we've lost a, quite a few uh, corn and grain sorghum crops or had it thinned out, especially on the ends of fields uh, where they didn't do a good job of controlling the uh, volunteer wheat uh, providing that. And we can also talk about diseases. The big one, of course, is wheat streak mosaic. The biggest problem with wheat streak mosaic is if we happen to be in an area that receives some hail and get that early volunteer which we call the green bed bridge. And if we get that, well, we can really have a problem if we don't control the volunteer, the early volunteer. A key factor in making your treatments effective is timing. It's critical to carefully monitor weed development and treat them at the proper time according to the label of your selected product. However, certain weather events could play into your desired schedule. Now, if we have a real drought, lots of times we want to wait and hope so we can get your rain and then spray about a week afterwards because we'll do a, better, a lot better job of weed control if the weeds are actively growing. So that's always one of the things. But we want to really be timing with those treatments 
Uh, weeds are a lot easier to control when they're small. Uh, if they get very big, we're going to have to use paraquat and we're going to have to go to some pretty high rates. And one thing we want to mention here, paraquat really requires good coverage. So we usually say you want to spray at least 20 gallons of carrier per acre so you get real good coverage when you're spraying paraquat. And on the subject of timing your treatments, split treatments have a good track record of effectiveness. As the wheat harvest in Nebraska has been humming along, Bob says this could be a good year to consider implementing a split herbicide treatment. Going in after harvest and putting on those early treatments, usually with paraquat or glyphosate, and for burn down, keep those weeds from going to seed. Then what we want to do is come back in September and apply the atrazine, a residual, if we're planting corn or sorghum uh, the next year. And of course, we want to tail tailor those rates for the soil type you have, and uh, that's important. But one thing we found out, that one pound of atrazine applied in like mid-September was more effective than three pounds applied in mid-July because the heat and so forth breaks it down. And of course, our intentions are we like to use lower rates of pesticide, uh, keep those pesticide uh, low rates low so we don't contaminate the environment any more than we have to. And we can really do that by using the split treatments and putting on the atrazine when it gives us the best results. Controlling volunteer wheat can mitigate numerous risks for other rotated crops, and following the EcoFallow system could improve your soil moisture profile as well as your yield output. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. Thanks, Bill. Another useful tool that can assist in planning your weed management is the Nebraska Extension 2020 Guide for Weed, Disease, and Insect Management in Nebraska. We've got a link to that on the Market Journal website. Let's take a look at the markets now, and according to the latest USDA Crop Progress Report, corn rated at 66% good to excellent, with silking at 61%. Soybeans rated 71% good to excellent, with blooming at 75%. All the makings for what looks like to be a very strong crop. I was joined by Trados's Doug Simon late on Wednesday, and we started our conversation by taking a deeper look into those crop condition numbers. Crop conditions on Monday, they were at um, 69% uh, both for corn and beans nationally. They were unchanged for the week. And with the hot weather we had last Saturday, 100 degrees, that thought that maybe those crop conditions on the corn might go down a little bit. Um, they actually went up in um, Illinois and uh, a couple of I states. Uh, Nebraska side of it, 66, you know, uh, good to excellent, you know, for corn. So we're in pretty good shape and 71% you know, percent on, the, on the beans. Um, you know, you've got some areas in Nebraska, you kind of go from Lincoln kind of north to Valentine. We've had some pretty good rains, but you go up by Fremont and Omaha, they're maybe 50% of their normal rainfall since January. And you go out in the southwest part of Nebraska, really dry. A lot of that corn's probably not going to do very well on the dry land side of it. Uh, so the, the heat, you know, and dryness is taking a toll in some areas. You know, we've had some nice rains here the last several days in Lincoln, which has been pretty helpful around, you know, kind of eastern Nebraska for dry land side of it. But when you go up to northeast Nebraska on this eastern side by the Missouri River, that's a dry land, you know, irrigated corn, but there's a lot of dry land corn too, and they don't think we'll have to see the yields that we've seen the last couple of years up there. We have been seeing a pretty hot July thus far, and yeah, that term weather market is being thrown around a lot. What are some marketing opportunities that we can take advantage of right now? Well, the corn market has fallen off here, you know, in the last several days, you know, on Monday, Tuesday, it popped back up on Wednesday a little bit. You know, where we had gone back up toward 360 on the DEES, and now we're back down toward 335 on the DEES. When you look at the USDA's acres and, and the yields and the carryover, they're projecting this to be, you know, call it 2.8 billion, give or take. That's still 800 million bushels than we had around, you know, projected last year. So their project, you know, projections for corn to be in that 290 to $3 range. So we're still probably got about 35, 40, 45 cents of risk premium in the corn market yet if we kind of go through and have, you know, fairly normal August. So you can buy some puts against October, you know, and spend, you know, maybe eight cents on the 330 October put, you know, if you want to hedge it, 
you know, maybe buy a call. I think you probably need some flexibility in here. The funds are still short, about 135,000 contracts. So they're still a little negative. They were long about 100,000 beans. They've kind of got back to long about 65,000 bushels of beans. But with the way the prices are so low, people don't really like selling in here. You can use some options to give you a little bit of flexibility here. Are you more optimistic with corn or with soybeans over this next little bit? I would be more optimistic for soybeans by a long way, just because of the fact that our world carryout on the soybean side, it's actually tightened up to about 30% when you look at the stocks to use ratios on a global standpoint, they're up toward 37%, you know, two years ago. So we've actually projected to drop below levels of carry out to stocks use ratios on the global situation on beans back to the 2014, 2015 period. So, and you also look at soybeans from the perspective of if you have a U.S., you know, if we would harvest 80 million acres, say, and you take two bushels out of yield, you know, say we were hot and dry in August, which there's more of a chance that weather's going to impact the beans. You could drop your carryover on the beans from maybe a 400 million bushel carryover and drop it back toward 250. So the, the, the bean balance sheet's got a chance to have some damage done to it where you could see some positivity in prices. And those world numbers are tight. If you look at it's soybean oil stocks, they're very tight. Malaysian palm oil's stocks are off like, I don't know, 20% from last year. Um, they're about 10% stocks to use ratios. Um, but all in all, like that, that, the, that soybean balance sheet's just a lot tighter than the corn. There's no way to put a positive spin on the corn balance sheet. I mean, when you look at a 2.8 to even, if you took 10 bushels out of national yield, maybe you can get us back to a 2, a two billion bushel carryover, then you could see prices maybe back toward 360 to, you know, 380, you know, again. But that requires us to drop 10 bushels out of yield right now, which at this point in the year, it's really tough to do. Let's talk about exports now for a minute. And recent corn purchase from China, largest ever made from the U.S. on the corn side and the third largest in history on any given day. And of course, China is still trying to do what they can to fulfill that phase one trade deal. What do you make of all this? Well, we had a 1.3 million metric ton sale, you know, two weeks ago, followed up with a 1.7. That's about 5 million metric tons. There's about 40 million uh, metric tons uh, per uh, metric ton. So three times 40, about 120 million bushels. So when our carryout's going to be 3 billion, I mean, that's, we need to export a lot more. We're still lagging on our total commitments this year versus what our, our goal is on the corn side of it. But that's a nice start. But overall, China is lagging you know, maybe 50% of their phase one goal. So, I mean, yeah, that's positive, but they're still way behind. Now, this morning on Wednesday, we had about a, a million metric tons of beans announced. Some, just a little bit of that was um, the 2019-20 crop. The bulk of it's 2021. So that's good to see um, that they're coming in here buying beans. But when you think back in the old days, we used to, you know, export maybe 32 million metric tons of beans to China and we're maybe around 16 million metric tons on the books for this year, according to USDA you know, foreign ag service number. So we're lagging there pretty seriously, but it's good to see those sales recently, but then you've got you know, issues in China. We want to get together on trade and cooperate, but there's a lot of geopolitical things that we're battling with with China uh, that continue to um, put a bad taste in their mouth and, and probably a bad taste in the mouth of the farmers as well. And over in Argentina, their corn harvest is moving along at a pretty quick pace due to some dry weather. Are we looking at more competition for our corn exports sooner than normal, you think? This time of the year, the, the safrina crop that comes out of Brazil, their second crop, they're finishing up harvest on that, and they've had a, a respectable yield. That's usually a big swing factor in the world markets. You know, they raise that after their wet season ends, and so it's a drier season crop and can get hurt by late season drop. And it's turned out well this year. So they're ex going to be competing with us on the export side of it. There's still a lot of beans on boats going to China uh, that are really aggressive, you know, moving, you know, beans out of there, uh, which have, you know, cut into our export share. But, you know, their crops in Brazil over the last year and Argentina have both been, been very good over there. Thanks to Doug for being here. Next week, we'll be joined by Luke Beckman of Central Valley Ag for a look at the markets. If you have a question that you'd like for me to ask him, email us or get in touch on social media, and I'll pass your question along. 
Next up, it was just over a year ago that the Nebraska National Guard pitched in on a statewide level to rescue people and livestock from the extreme flood of 2019. By mid-April last year, nearly 400 National Guard soldiers and airmen had served on statewide active duty on a total of 102 support air or ground missions during the disaster. Fast forward one year later, and the Guard has been at it again, but this spring it took on an entirely new role, helping rural communities in the fight against COVID-19. Read about the role the Nebraska National Guard has played in helping rural Nebraskans in the midst of the pandemic in the July Nebraska Farmer. Time now for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. And Al, a few hit or miss showers came through this week. It's July though, so of course the heat is going to be a big story. How's the forecast look? Well, Troy, it's been an interesting week. We've seen the heat last weekend. Cooler temperatures moved in as a cold front started to blow through the state on Sunday. Of course, we generated some thunderstorm activity. Then we had subsequent waves of the thunderstorm activity move across the state. Big winter, southern Nebraska. Unfortunately, parts of the southeast panhandle, northwest panhandle, northeast Nebraska, and parts of central Nebraska really missed out on a lot of the moisture. But we had some pretty significant moisture in southern Nebraska, and that goes well to reduce some of the drought in that part of the state. And of course, the temperatures have risen ever since the end of the week. And now we go into the weekend and it looks like we're going to repeat almost to a T, like I said, what we went through this last week. So let's go to the upper air models and see what we have stored as we go through this seven day period. As you can see from today's graphic, we have high pressure centered over this the southern plains region at a trough to our northwest. And we're going to apologize for some of these graphic colors coming up. Our package from our provider did not provide any color, so everything's in black and white, back to the old days. But low pressure, basically two in eastern portions of the Dakotas will concentrate most of the precipitation, maybe some weak precipitation across northwestern portions of the sand hills. And then we'll see high pressure firmly in control across the southern plains. That trough deepens tomorrow as it goes to our east. It brings a little bit cooler air and a cold front tries to move through the state particularly during the afternoon hours and time and everything in terms of who gets the precipitation, but I-80 southward has the best chance. Monday, we start to see that ridge building back in somewhat, but remember, we're gonna be on the front edge of that ridge in eastern Nebraska. So we're gonna be more in a northwest flow and that cool air is gonna hang up. So we'll probably see some thunderstorm activity at the Kansas and point southward. And then on Tuesday, we try to see that ridge trying to build back in, bring just a slightly warmer air into the region but energy will ride around the periphery of that ridge. Low pressure at the surface develops in the Dakotas and in southwestern portions of Kansas. That will allow convergence in southern Kansas. And that most likely will begin to move toward the north as that high pressure ridge itself starts to build northward on Wednesday. We start to see low pressure forming again in the, tech, or the Oklahoma panhandle. Good source of moisture feeding northward. With the movement of that ridge to the north, that's going to create convergence in eastern Nebraska and good thunderstorm activity is likely. And on Thursday, the high pressure builds right back into the western portions of the High Plains region. High pressure firmly in control, much warmer temperatures return in earnest to the western part of the state. In eastern Nebraska, will probably be closer to normal as the warm air hangs up for one more day and we have scattered thunderstorm activity. But by next Friday, that ridge builds in earnest into the central and southern plains. Low pressure forms in the High Plains region just not a lot of lift or moisture. There may be a little bit of showers developing in western Nebraska, but overall it looks to be the start of about a four to five day trend of warmer temperatures, but we still break it as we get into the first full weekend of, of uh, August. And in terms of temperatures above normal for this period for next Thursday, the following Tuesday, the high pressure firmly in control. And in regards to precipitation, we expect below normal precipitation, particularly with high pressure firmly in, in control over the central Rocky Mountains. So Troy, overall, the most of the heat that we're going to deal with this week will be this weekend. It's going to be pretty miserable out there with the high humidity, but we'll break that as we go into tomorrow. Cool temperatures at the beginning of the week, several chances of thunderstorm activity, and the heat returns as we get to the end of next week. Looks like we're going to go into the dog days of summer in earnest as we get the 1st of August. So batten down the hatches. It's summer, and that's what we expect this time of the year. Thanks, Al. Finally today, the pandemic has changed the way we live our lives with in-person events, one of the top things on the list, taking a back seat. However, Nebraska Extension is still offering a large variety of workshops and field days that you can attend from the comfort of your own home. Two virtual field days are currently available through the University of Nebraska. The first is the 2020 Virtual Weed Management Field Day recorded at the South Central Ag Lab. 
Next, the 2020 Virtual Field Day for Management of Atrazine, Glyphosate, and ALS Inhibitors Resistant Palmer Amaranth in Corn. These virtual experiences cover many topics, including comparison of herbicide programs for weed control in soybeans and corn, atrazine alternatives for pre-emergence weed control, effects of row spacing, and herbicide programs for control of resistant Palmer amaranth. That's just a few of the topics. For livestock producers, the 2020 Nebraska Grazing Conference will be held virtually this year as well. This is the 20th year for the Nebraska Grazing Conference. However, due to COVID-19 restrictions, this year's conference will be held in a virtual format. The dates of the conference remain the same, Tuesday, August 11th, and Wednesday, August 12th. We have three themes for this year's conference. The first theme is Weather Ready Ranches, which will open the conference on Tuesday afternoon. The second theme, which will close the conference on Tuesday afternoon, is uh, Ranch of the Future. The other theme for Wednesday afternoon's program is Invasive Woody Plant Management. Martha Shulsky, state climatologist, will speak on current, past, and future climate trends. Justin Derner, who's a rangeland scientist with USDA ARS in Wyoming, will speak on projected and current trends on rangeland production and quality. During the Ranch of the Future session, Travis Mullenix from UNL will provide information on using new technology for the ranch. Derock Twidwell and Caleb Roberts both from UNL will discuss cedar management using prescribed fire and scaling up management for resilient grazing lands. Another big change to this year's grazing conference, due to the online format of the event, there will be no registration fee associated with the event. That's always good news. For more information on these events, be sure to check out the Market Journal website. We've got all the information right there. That's going to do it for this week's show. If you missed a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app or follow us on social media to join in on the conversation. And don't forget, you can get the latest updates on the coronavirus outbreak at covid19.unl.edu. Hope to see you right back here next time. I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.